we'll just i think start okay so hello and welcome to this uh, another event in our series called critical humanities at csds it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today professor b venkat mani from the university of wisconsin madison venkat is professor of german and world literature and former director of the center for south asia at wisconsin madison he is the author of a author and editor of a host of books and articles i do not have time to read out the full list but i want to mention some which i think will be have will have critical bearings on his talk today his first book cosmopolitical claims came out in 2007 and the second more recent one recording world literature came out in 2017 he is the co-editor of two very important collections the first one what counts as world literature came out in 2013 and the wily blackwell companion to world literature in 2020 venkat is one of the leading authorities on contemporary debates on world literature so i'll just set out a few ideas before we hand it over to venkat for his talk today now the idea of world literature or world literature in german as you know emerged in early 19th century most notably with goethe though he didn't coin the term because it was already in circulation among some members of weimar classicism like christoph marlin martin weiland for instance but goethe nevertheless made it popular and speculated on its future career this goethean vision had at least two significant claimants in subsequent centuries first the idea of world literature was appropriated by the new discipline of comparative literature as its eventual and somewhat ethical horizon a wide range of comparatives from let's say eric auerbach to edward said appealed to the philological core of world literary studies and often passionately promoted it as a way of revitalizing the disciplinary protocols of comparative literature and second world literature also functioned as a diffused idea and a code for literary excellence in publishing in book trade and also in different kinds of print cultures this idea is often expressed as a global canon across time and space as in for instance the notion of timeless classic or let's say international best sellers now in the last couple of decades the idea of world literature has haunted the more traditional literature departments with national orientations and has led to several very important and interesting debates and exchanges venkat's <coughs> excuse me venkat's recent book recording world literature is one such important intervention in current debates among other things in my opinion he accomplishes three very vital tasks in this book first he painstakingly historicizes the german origin of world literature second he shifts the focus from the narrow anglo american academia to print cultures and public sphere where books circulate they get translated and eventually read and third he introduces this fascinating concept of biblio migrancy or physical movements of books which, through which books travel and get coded and recorded venkat's book has been praised widely and it has received several awards in the last couple of years or so i think we'd like to hear more from him now thank you so much venkat for agreeing to be part of our discussion here on critical humanities at csds as we say now the screen is yours thank you thank you so much baidek um i want to thank all of you i want to start by thanking uh, baidek um csds for hosting me in this very important lecture series critical humanities um you all have been doing fantastic work i have such great uh, respect for the work that comes out of csds so it's a, i think of this as um not just one single collaboration but uh conversations that have been happening through baidek and now can be extended first in the zoom space and then later um in person post pandemic i do want to thank um praveen rai and ayodhya ji for all of the the logistical support too um and uh, of course all of you who are here um thank you for making time on a friday night um my 
some of my friends and family are, and he, are here and I do want to uh, do a big shout out to Professor Madhu Sahni, whom I just saw, um, who is very much uh, sort of at, the, at JNU in the German department, um, who really built the foundation of uh, the, the kind of work that I can do today. And um, this is um, just to explain, um, um, start with gratitude. Um, and um, and then we'll get to uh, the actual the core of um, what I need to present today. So um, I have done, you know, the when the book came out in 2017, I had the honor, and I want to thank uh, friends and colleagues at JNU, um, but also at the Delhi University, who had invited me to present lectures on the book. Um, this was uh, 2016. Uh, late 2016. So the book actually physically wasn't even out yet. And uh, so now I want to thank Baidik because three years after a publication of a book, how do you go back to a book, right? That was one of the challenges that um, I embraced. And uh, what I thought was I will bring it in conversation with the kind of discussions and the kind of developments that are happening um, in the South Asian scene, specifically in India. And then during the Q&A, um, I'd be happy to also entertain questions as to how um, working on, um, you know, the trying to de um the German canon, the German library, the German archive has actually enriched my own work on South Asia. So I'll start with, uh, I've kept it entertaining. I know it's a Friday evening, it's nine o'clock and it's the great city of Delhi. So uh, you all have taken time. I've, I've tried to keep it both entertaining, a um, little bit of education and uh, a lot of delight. That's the idea. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is share screen and I'll walk you. I'm not going to, it gets very tedious on Zoom when uh, one reads out of a script. So I'm just going to walk you through a PowerPoint and speak extemporaneously. Um, and uh, I hope that you will be able to see my PowerPoint. Okay, can everyone see it? Yes, we can. We can. Yeah, and it's on full screen, right? Yes. Perfect. So I'm going to speak today about world literature as a pact with books. And later I'm going to come to what this pact with books, what the term world literature actually means to me. And given the, uh, the kind of work that comes out of, of the South Asian, the Indian context, I'm specifically going to talk about the uh, move that I traced, the journey that I traced from Orientalist catalogs to a kind of post colonial bibliomigrancy. So the book itself covers 200 years of uh, German cultural history, uh, print cultural history, political history. And so it's, it's a political reading of world literature and a political reading of world literature through histories of libraries and through histories of print cultures. Um, the place where I want to begin um, this is the book, and I just want to tell you that the cover is actually from the Istanbul Museum of Modern Art, where books come flying at you. And this was, I have it on the cover also because it's a very inspirational figure for me. When books come sort of flying at you, what do you do with them? How do books travel? Why do some books come flying at us and other books do not? And that's one of the, the questions. Um, that uh, has been at the core of this book, the core of this project, which I'll be honest, in all earnest, um, I started writing seriously in 2011 when I was a Humboldt Fellow at uh, the University of Leipzig and at the German National Library. And so it's taken um, about, it took about six years for me to finish the book and then it came out in 2017. Um, but in the last three years, uh, the book has acquired its own life. So it's time for me to sort of think through what the core ideas were and how they are inflecting, how they can be useful um, for people, uh, wonderful audiences like you who are here to listen to me today. So the story of bibliomigrancy actually doesn't start with my engagement with Goethe. I grew up in Haridwar and that's why I have this um, Nandan, this is actually an issue from 1990. I was at JNU by the time 
um, this issue came out. But they had this tradition. They had in the in the seventies and eighties this Vishwaki Mahan Kritya, and I used to love this particular. I used to look forward to this particular column um, in London every month because this was sort of a very interesting way for me as a, a young reader to think about stories which were not from India or were from India, but then were mentioned as Mahan Kritya. I obviously, as a child, I didn't ever think about, you know, what Mahan Kritya, et cetera, is, because I was more interested in the plot and characters, as most people do. And later, I would come to this li little um, um, section that they had about where it came from. So here you can see this is um, Vishwaki Mahan Kritya Prakrit. Um, there was French, there was German, there was English, you know, there were all kinds of stories that were told in such a beautiful fashion that uh, for years that was one of the reasons why I love this book, Nandan. Now, uh, this magazine. So that's the beginning of thinking about world literature for me. Of course, um, time makes uh, sharpens your memory um, it dulls your memory but it also sharpens your memory in wonderful ways and um in 2009 when i was in in delhi i had this great honor of actually going to the nandan office and meeting the person who um was behind this the this idea and so that was a very gratifying experience for me the next is this particular text, uh, Dostoevsky's Aparad Hardand. So I come from a lower middle class family and I loved reading. And so my whole idea was to spend the least amount of money and to buy the fattest book so I could read it for the longest time. And I had absolutely no idea, you know, and those of you who are from small towns or those of you who grew up in pre-1990s India, you remember those wonderful Soviet book vans, these bookmobiles they, that used to come in small towns, um, but perhaps also in big cities. And that was, uh, for us, that was the biggest attraction, right? Um, I mean, there was Kumbh Mela that came every 12 years, uh, where the National Book Trust came and did this whole big pradarshini, you know, this exhibition of books published, and many of them were translations from Indian literatures, but also, um, but also uh, international literature. And of course, uh, in those days of, of Indo-Soviet friendship and whatnot, um, you had these bookmobiles that would come into small towns and um, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, of course. And I picked it up when I was in eighth grade. Of course, I had no idea who Dostoevsky was and what this massive, I mean, years later when I read it again, and first at JNU and later at Stanford, I thought, you know, what the hell was I thinking when I was reading this Dostoevsky? But I read it simply as this young man's story, Raskolnikov, who murders a woman, and then the rest of the book is about his guilt and whatnot and whatever happens, and he comes from a poor background. So the plot was important. So the reason why I'm saying this is these are stations of reading in the life of a reader that writing this book helped me go back to, but also conceive. And this was this historical knowledge that I took in when I started approaching the materials, the archival findings, and instead of, and Baidik has also mentioned that it's not just Anglo-American theories that interested me, I just found myself in the midst of a very vast um, archival reserve, and not just one archive, but various stories that were just popping up like popcorn, and they needed to be put into the book. And that became the inspiration for me to also train myself in book history. And uh, at the University of Leipzig as a Humboldt fellow, I actually took classes in the history of the book, and Buch als Ware, uh, this was a master's for, for seminar for students there, uh, the book as commodity. And uh, so the entire book market and how that works. And then here at UW-Madison through a wonderful South Asia librarian, Todd Michael Sanambalang, I read a lot of um, um, uh, theories of libraries, of circulation. And so that helped me understand a little bit more what David Damrosh then in his book, um, What is World Literature? Um, refers to as circulation, 
uh, reception and translation. And quickly I found that circulation, reception, and translation had their own political histories, and those need to be dug up. So um, what I'm going to do for the rest of the lecture is just walk you through, sit back, relax, and have a good time, um, just to tell you what this lecture actually entails. So I'm going to give you glimpses of some historical foundations, some theoretical propositions, and therein will come this concept, bibliomigrancy, bibliomigrancy, movement of books, migration of books. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the concept of libraries. And what is very important for me is literature in the public sphere. So this entire book is about the social lives of books. The public lives of books, the public lives of authors, translators, and readers, not only about literature professors and students of literatures, because there's a much bigger world out there. Books are not written, that they get included in syllabus, syllabi, and syllabi, you know, are some of the most political documents in the world. Everybody knows that. But the books don't just remain under the constraints of a syllabus. And so we need to go beyond that and think about what lives do book acquire in the public sphere. And so my book is also not about this term that I absolutely abhor, lost in translation. No, it's very much about found in translation. There, there are some intersections with Damrosh's thinking about translation as well, gains in translation, and that's what he calls us. And I call it found in translation, and how they are found, I'll be explaining later on. Then I'll propose some central arguments. And um, this was through this conversation with Baidik that um, I wanted to showcase some of the case studies pertaining to this movement from Orientalist to post-colonial bibliomigrancy. Um, and I've written the stories that build theories because that's also part of my method, right? Not taking some theory that is floating around and trying to see if it fits my scheme, but let the material speak to me and say, what is the kind of generalizations? What are the kinds of larger uh, observations that are emerging from this from the from the uh, from the material, from the objects that I'm studying, from the institutions that I'm critiquing. So that's part of uh, what builds into this book. And in the very end, I'll just say a few words about the advantages of pursuing this print cultural material histories. Um, what's the use of it? Why bother? Right? As I tell my students all the time, why bother with a particular subject? There has to be a reason for that. And that's where I'm also trying to start here. So let me just read two of my favorite, favorite authors in translation, of course, not in Spanish, not in Turkish, um, but this, is, this marks also the beginning of the book for me. So I'm just going to read this um, verbatim. The universe, which others call a library, is composed of an indefinite, perhaps infinite number of hexagonal galleries. Like all the men of the library, in my early days, I traveled in quest of a book, perhaps the catalog of catalogs. Pay attention to this catalog of cat catalogs. Think WorldCat, think Google, okay? This is much before WorldCat, much before Google. This is Jorge Luis Borges in the Library of Babel, written in 1949. Then of course is the Nobel laureate Oran Pamuk, because of whom I learned Turkish, to a great extent. This is a book called Yeni Hat, uh, The New Life. And I'm just going to, it's not here, but the, first, the opening line of this novel is uh, One day I read a book and my entire life changed. It's the most captivating line, I have to say, and for readers of German literature, this actually goes back to Novalis, a history that I trace um, in my writing about Pamuk and specifically about this book as well. But what I came back to this book and let's read the, the rest of it. Um, my dazzled eyes could no longer distinguish the world that existed within the book from the book that existed within the world. Which book, which world? That became central to my thinking about this book. So, the book itself, as you know, traditionally used to be a portable volume, 
consisting, consisting of a series of written, printed, or illustrated pages bound together for the ease of reading. This is Oxford English Dictionary. Today, it is a digital file. It's a body of text and image, right? It can display on screen. It looks like a book. It's not a physical book. It imbibes, it imitates a medium that has existed for 800 years or more. Then you come to the library, a physical building, right? An imposing structure, room or a set of rooms, collection of books for the use of the public. Think this by Gandhi Mark, you know, you go from uh, Max Miller Herman Library to the British Council to American Center that used to be across the street. Um, if you start way behind on Kasturba Gandhi Mark Sahit Academy Library, right? This was, this is like my favorite street in Delhi. And think old Delhi, you know, the the library of, um, what is it called? Um, my God, that's a library that everybody should go to. Um, books aren't dead. We all know that. So at the beginning of this whole ebook Kindle revolution, um, this was the Newspe Newsweek, uh, Newsweek, a magazine that now does not exist in print. It only exists uh, online. So this was the cover image, um, which um, very much uh, um, emphasizes, underlines, underscores the change of books. And uh, audio books we've known for a while. We know that audio books have changed from what used to be. I also grew up my first few years. We didn't have a television, so radio was fantastic. And so um, there were actually readings of literary works on the radio. And uh, I grew up with that. And today you can actually, you don't have to buy a CD or an MP3. Um, there are wonderful readers who are reading um, literature from around the world. There is uh, Kahani Suno. Um, they read uh, Prem Chan. They read, this is on YouTube. They read Prem Chan. They read um, um, Rabindranath Tagore. These are, this is in Hindi. Um, beautiful narrator, the amazing, captivating voice. And this is my favorite. This is self so audiobooks. And uh, now that I am trying to really brush up my, my Gurmukhi as well, um, this is my go to place. And the narration is absolutely fantastic. You know, Pavitra Papi, he's just started. But uh, for people who are more interested in lives of farmers at the turn of the 20th century, I have to say you have to re you have to read, read and or listen to all parts of Tutanaku. It's absolutely amazing. So these are the ways in which the world of books is also changing. And then, of course, the library. Right. I don't have slides of many digital libraries. You all know you've been accessing materials on PDF and you've been going to um, you know, various um, databases to do your research. And, and uh, you used to be able to go to the library. The library comes to you now in different ways. Thanks also to our librarians who are actually, there is someone who actually does this work. Okay, so this is not some free floating, um, automatically generated material, but this is where the project also gained a very different angle. I was supposed to, uh, I organized actually on the 25 years of, of uh, German re reunification, um, a conference. And uh, no, it was 20 years, yeah, 89 to 2009. And um, I got interested in this newly launched um, European library. And what interested me is um, the European library is a free service that offers access to resources of 48 national libraries of Europe. And then comes what is a national library? A national library is a library specifically established by a country to store its information database. National libraries usually host the legal deposit and bibliographic control center of a nation. Think about this phrase, bibliographic control center of a nation. And my whole thing was, how can a library become a bibliographic control center of a nation? And especially libraries in Europe, which are full of materials from Asia and Africa, thanks to colonialism. Are they only 
bound today within the political boundaries of the nation states, European nation states as they exist today. Are they really the bibliographic control centers of their own nations, or do they also have bibliographic multiple centers, right? This worldly dispersed objects. Think about Istanbul Museum of Modern Art, think about flying books. Um, aren't they really centers, um, these polycentric book dispersion, book movement? How can that have a singular European center? In other words, this was the most Eurocentric definition of a library, even in the digital world that I came across. And I thought I wanted to study this. And so I got a little grant to go to um, The Hague, where their, their um, um, headquarters are. And I said, uh, you know, I'd like to come and, and research and archive. And they wrote to me and they said, everything is available on, on digitally. You don't even need to come. And that just struck me as if something massive has happened here. Because if I do not need to go to an archive to research the history of a library, there's obviously a much bigger change that is happening, this was 2009, that one needs to think about. And out of these multiple sort of um, events, accidents, um, stations of questioning is what led to um, the birth of recoding. So coding and recoding. And during the q and I can expand more about why I played with the word coding and recoding. And so for me, the central idea here was, no, it's, it doesn't have to be about ownership. It has to be about borrowing privileges, a term that I can open up later on. So my book, essentially, what does it do? <clears throat> it exposes the dual valences of the term book, of the term library, as commodity and culture, as a material, as an intellectual artifact. And what I try to establish here is that material histories of books and libraries actually enrich our conceptual catalogs of world literature or of categories such as national literatures, post-colonial literatures, um, regional literatures, South Asian literature, African literature, right? Um, we cannot, and this is what I found, I'm not going to go into details of the Anglo-American theory, but mostly what I found was there was, on the one hand, extremely rich scholarship coming out in thinking about the movement from the post-colonial um, to uh, world literature and translation, or there were these wonderful discussions and debates and fights um, about, you know, the, the nature and concept of comparative literature, the significance of reading and comparing in original versus reading and comparing in translation, all very enriching. But I thought these were also happening sort of almost at a distance from what one would call the actual world of access to the original, to the translations. And so this is, initially, I was thinking about writing a book about, you know, a little bit more about German and Indian history. And I was, I came across a collection, and I'll talk about it in a minute. And my first question was, look, this is all this material is in, is in original, and it's sitting in a German library. What is it doing here? How did it arrive here? And that, for me, was the beginning of starting to think about access. So essentially, the book is trying to say, you know, and you see the, the sort of imbalanced uh, um, um, uh, graphic here, the asymmetries that exist between objects and collections, which are then conditioned or, or impacted by historical conditioning, cultural linguistic inflections, and together they give political charge to the term world literature. So that brings us to the dual valence of the term world literature by the also mentioned, and I trace that history in, in the first chapter of, uh, no, in the introduction to my book, but also the first chapter, that there, there is a dual valence in the birth of this term world literature as well. So there is very much this enlightenment below uh, cosmopolitanism built 
into it, something borderless, something that goes beyond the local, that engages with the extra local. Um, but it happens right at the same time, mind you, Goethe makes a statement in um, 1830, 1828, and um, it's recorded by Eckermann and then published in 1836 in Gespräche mit Goethe, in Conversations with Goethe. So there, this is the high time of colonialism. And so we cannot just get swayed by this Enlightenment cosmopolitanism uh, and forget about the histories of colonial, imperial, and then later post-colonial global anglophone hierarchizations that are also happening, right? So this is the other dual balance that Goethe and Auerbach later, we'll talk about Auerbach, the aesthetic affinities that Goethe is trying to establish in his statement, um, they're given a very different um, meaning. They're granted a very different treatment and framing by, of course, Marx and Engels, the greatest thinkers about material history. So I'll come to that quote. But Marx and Engels and their, uh, their reflections on world literature sort of remain central. That's a thread that goes through my thinking about um, world literature. And uh, that's where I get curious about Orientalism, about translation enterprises, about the empire of books. There were these grand statements being made, at least in Germany, ein Bücherreich, an empire of books acquisition of mass collections, then nationalist dimensions. And this is something that nobody has actually discussed. And um, people must discuss. World literature is not just connected to Enlightenment cosmopolitanism, definitely not in the 19th century, later in the 19th century in the German context, and definitely not later in the 20th century in the Nazi context, because this term is actually manipulated. It is it, it, it is laden with nationalist fervor. In the 19th century, there is anti-Semitism attached to the term. In the 20th century, there is anti-Semitism and racial purity that is infused into this term. And we also need to think about that history when we think about the term world literature. So the central questions of the book, of course, are what do books and libraries tell us about the terms world? literature and world literature. Then what is the role of the empire and later the nation state in the circulation, reception and translation of world literature? Most importantly, how are reading publics created? Right? How are reading publics created? Because the thesis, this one of the theses in the book is, it's not just the author or the translator, tra publishers, librarians, state institutions, um, distributions, critics, everybody, anthologists play a very important role in the creation of uh, in the creation of a reading public. How does that happen? State subsidized translation enterprises. India has had a long tradition of that. How does the catalogue of world literature become politically and ideologically inflected, sometimes through facilitation, other times through suppression by the state? And just to express in dialogue with something that's going on in CSDS, I know you all listen to Francesca Orsini, the scholar I have nothing but utmost respect for, and she spoke about Hindi internationalism. And so to, to convey in Francesca's terms, you know, what kind of new internationalisms new kind of cosmopolitanisms come into play. And Baidik, you know, his fantastic book on world literature, um, I very much uh, like this term formations of the literary. So how do colonial and post-colonial formations of the literary actually impact the impact the conceptual career of the term? And how should we actually frame the conceptual career of the term? That's one of the things. So this is kind of the thicker, heavier part, and then we'll move to the lighter part again. And so these are some of the central things that I'm arguing in this book, uh, uh, some of the, the um, assertions um, that my book makes. Um, first, of course, it's simple. The term world literature is a construct. But the construction of the category 
of world literature, especially since the 19th century, excuse me, has relied on an indelible connection between the book and the sociopolitical world, which means that the terms associated with world literature in different parts of the world, Vishwa Sahitya, Dunya Adibiyate, Welt Literatur, they all have different political inflections. Languages do not occur in political vacuums either. And so terms for certain categories will definitely have different inflections. World literature, as we read, see, in the United States today is very different from world literature as it was understood by Tagore in the early 20th century, as it's understood by Mahadevi Varma, who I'll come to later, or Dunya de Biate, as it's conceived of by Oram Pamuk. Um, second, libraries in their multiple meanings, a house of books, a series of publications, um, a digital surrogate later on. So libraries have served as important way stations in the collection and dissemination of world literary texts as books or manuscripts in original and in translation. So one hierarchy that I'm trying to break in this book, and I continue to do that, is this privileging of the original over translation. Because for me, translations are as important as the original. They are works of art, they are, they are, um, they are creative works within their own rights. And it's uh, respecting the, the pursuit of translation, but also the impact that it has in creating leaderships. That for me remains important. And then of course, along with publishers and booksellers, libraries have contributed to the conceptualization of world literature as a literary catalog of the world. So this is where the Soviet bookmobile, the Soviet book van comes in again, right? The literary catalog of the world, a kind of a global bookmobile. Um, on this point, I want to say that the famous book historian, this book is also an attempt to get away from German and French uh, uh, modes of looking at circulation of books. Robert Danton, the great uh, librarian and scholar of, of book history, um, has this uh, uh, wonderful sort of schemata for how books travel. Um, he calls it circuits of communication, right? Books exist on circuits of communication. So they move from um, the author to the publisher, to the bookseller, to the reader. And um, if you think about colonial circuits of communication, if you think about post-colonial circuits of communication, what Danton says might be true of, you know, sort of um, extremely literate, uh, well, endowed in terms of uh, financial capital societies like um, Switzerland or France or perhaps Germany, but books world in a very different fashion in other parts of the world. So there cannot be one size fits all definition of circuits of communication. And that's where the term bibliomigrancy for me comes in. But before that, World literature is a literary catalog of the world. And it is, if it is, then it's far from a neutral, alphabetically organized bibliography of masterpieces. Translations and circulation do not happen in historical or sociocultural or political vacuum. And then the proliferation of world literature in a society depends on its relationship with print culture, or now one can say digital culture. This is where the pact with books come in. And it's a Faustian pact. Faust, we can talk about it. It's a pact with knowledge. It's also a pact with the devil. So bibliomigrancy relating to books or migration. And this is, you know, uh, Baidik mentioned cosmopolitical claims. I consider myself someone who likes to think about human migration as well as uh, migration of ideas together. And my work on migration of human beings, my work on migration literature, and especially Turkish German literature, um, helped me a lot in thinking about this term bibliomigrancy. 
So moving, moving to a different place, simply stated, bibliomigrancy is a way of thinking about a political, culturally infect, inflected um, mode of the circulation, the circuitive communication that Robert Danton mentioned. So it's a conduit that helps us think about the historical conditioning, um, the cultural determination, and the political charge of the term world literature, but also of books and libraries. Um, but you can't think about bibliomigrancy also in some kind of an ideational conceptual vacuum. And so therefore I came across these, I not came across, I concocted these four terms. Um, bibliotheque, the library itself, the material or the symbolic space that's created and inhabited by literary artifacts, but not necessarily only literary. I'm focusing on literary just because it has to do with world literature. Then the bibliograph, right? From the space, we move to the actual list, the inventory of such artifacts and objects into a catalog. And um, the, um, the name is escaping me, the great French uh, book historian, my God. Anyway, the name will occur to me in a minute. Um, he talks about political inventories of artifacts, and I really like that idea. And that's where instead of a bibliography, I'm calling it a bibliograph. And graph, writing, right? So not writing the book, but actually writing a list the inventory of books itself. Bibliophile, we all know. But bibliophile for me is not just, you know, someone who collects rare editions, etc. I think of bibli bibliophiles as end users, the readers and authors who exercise agency, imagine their subjectivities through the bibliotheque and the bibliocaph. And of course, this is a term I made up too, the bibliophobe. The bibliophobe is a person, agency, cultural collective, an ideological entity or state apparatus that recognizes the power of books in libraries and therefore simply impedes access to them, right? This is where the censorship ka naag jo hota wo apna pan uthata hai. This is where you see that thing happening where books are banned, books are burned, we can think about it. Okay, so when you, when you construct this conceptual theoretical edifice, for me, that's where multiple meanings of world literature start emerging. So I propose that world literature is a mode of freedom. It's a strategy of affiliation, the way people connect with books from around the world in original or in translation, the reader's affiliation to that particular reading material. It's also a process of creation and interpretation. A writer writing about the world, connecting the world, and then a reader interpreting that world. Martin Buchner calls it worldly literature, very nice term. It's also a unit of aesthetic evaluation. We all think about a work that becomes for us a mirror, an entry, a pathway into the world at a given point of time, um, especially in a pedagogical situation, how that becomes a unit of aesthetic evaluation. We exercise it in different forms in our pedagogies as well. And then it is a system of classification. And the system of classification comes not just from some kind of a conceptual organization, but those random, rare, miscellaneous books that booksellers do not know where exactly to place them, um, or uh, library catalogs. And especially when I studied the Library of Congress's cataloging system, in the beginning, they had a confusion because the, that, that cataloging system was so um, sort of author nationality based um, that uh, they had issues thinking about where to put um, Sarojini Naidu, for example, you know, she was writing in English, but she was coming from an, uh, the non-English speaking world. Um, so that, that kind of, the systems that, that 
construct institutions. That's the part of the book. So if I haven't bored you so far, we can get to the lighter side again. These are just crane shots. These are spotlights. Those were close-ups. Now we come to these spotlights that I'll walk you through and then I'll wrap up. Um, so <clears throat> the idea of books circulating, you know, we cannot just start with the 19th century. And that's why we need to think about um, literacy or print culture not as something that happens in, in a kind of Darwinian evolutionary model, right? That from orality, we go to literacy. Because if you look at the history of books, and that's one of the, the, the most wonderful propositions in, in um, Sheldon Pollock's The Language of the Gods and the World of Men, that for the longest time, um, especially uh, ideas that were circulating around uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia, um, they were being circulated in both ways. So one was Kantasta in the throat, and then the Granthast in the book. And then, of course, you had all of those, uh, you know, edicts and, and uh, um, the stupa and, and uh, various other forms of existence of books in a different way. Um, so even today, and that's why I told you about the Serbsuk, um, audiobooks. But, you know, it's not as if this is orality is completely lost or the oral pleasure in reading in engaging with literary texts is, is just has just disappeared. There are multiple ways in which books can exist, coexist. Um, then, of course, is the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, a text that I teach every year. And this is, of course, the flood tablet uh, from the Epic of Gilgamesh, a story that then makes it to the Bible as well. And um, I know this is, I'll tell you the joke that I tell my students, which is, you know, there were clay tablets, and so now everybody is reading on their e tablets. And so um, it just creates a bit of a resonance among the students, too, that we're back to scrolling a little bit. Um, but the idea that, that, this particular, the tablets were also found through colonial archaeology. This was um, the, the moment of discovery of Ashur Banipal's library that existed for almost 2800 years, right? Um, Ashur Banipal's library, I think, can be dated back to the 20th century, uh, 2010 before the Common Era. And then it's discovered in the mid 19th century. And then these tablets from uh, um, uh, Nineveh are then brought to the British Museum. And so that kind of decoding, right? Decoding of the Epic of Gilgamesh, and then it's recoding in English that has also a colonial history attached to it. This is the kind of bibliomigrancy. Then, of course, before that, there is Rasmanama. This is from the 16th century, the Persian translation of the Sanskrit, Mahabharat. We also know that Dara Shiko, uh, translated a number of Sanskrit works into English. And then this is, of course, Reklam. Um, this is a very prestigious and, and uh, quite well-known German publisher. Um, publishes Bruder Grimm. These are also stories that have a history of migration um, incorporated into them, and then they are collected as German quote-unquote stories. And I say this because when Goethe actually makes that statement about world literature, right, it's an interesting time in Germany that on the one hand there is nationalization of the German language that's happening through uh, the Brothers Grimm collection of, of uh, fairy tales. Well, in English, they're called fairy tales. It's um, uh, Kinder und Hausmärchen, their children, but also folk tales, house tales. And there is that kind of nationalization of the language happening. They've also started the project of, of the, the Great German Dictionary. But then Goethe is thinking about going beyond world literature. And um, so I'll just read you, this is the word that I want to draw your attention to, that for Goethe, poesy becomes the common property, the Gemeingut of Menschheit, of humanity. This is a 64 translation, universal possession of mankind, one with translated also as shared property, 
common property because that's exactly what Marx and Engels are going to do in the Communist Manifesto. Think about it. The um, Once again, the same word, Gemeingut, intellectual creations of individual nations become common property. And so this is the time when uh, uh, Marx and Engels are actually reflecting on the bourgeoisie's exploitation of the world market and the consumption, production in every country, um, as in the material, so in the intellectual production. As in the material, so in the intellectual production is something that we can see in the current stage of globalization, post 1990s, where the book as a commodity and as culture, literature as a commodity and as culture acquire the central, um, acquire quite, a, quite a new uh, um, meaning. This is, of course, the Asiatic society. So what I'm trying to say in the book, too, is Goethe does not make his statement in absence. And now I'm just going to give you snapshots of the chapters as I move along. Um, this is, of course, the Asiatic Society Library. And this was a big uh, archival find for me, the, uh, the uh, presence of this very well thought out Oriental Translation Fund. It was established in 1828. And Goethe, when, his, when he makes his statement, he's actually reading a Chinese novel in translation, translated in Macau, uh, near Hong Kong, and then um, brought to the Kyonig uh, um, and uh, Amelia Bibliothek, uh, where Goethe was also a patron. And that's where he reads this, this book, uh, the, the Chinese novel translated into English, but reaches Goethe's desk, right? This, this is the kind of bibliomagnancy. And a number of these books being translated into English, this was a program established by the British Empire um, with participation from a number of royal families around. And um, as they were uh, grooming, as they were establishing these seats of Arabic language and Sanskrit, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in Oxford, um, there was a, 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 a there was an army of translators, scholars who were then translating for the Oriental Translation Fund, and once again, possession. Public may be put in possession of all that is valuable in Eastern literature. Right? That's the. This is an empire subsidized translation enterprise that inflects the, the construction of, of world literature and the very idea of bibliomigrancy, the, the masterpieces, the timeless pieces. Um, so it's, it's an important station, in other words. And these are maps that I drew with our geography lab. Um, I'm not an expert, but um, every chapter also has these maps. And uh, so I've tried to trace these routes of bibliomigrancy. You know, it's based on so the airlines map, but how books were traveling to think about them visually also became important for me. So this is sort of roughly just the routes of, of bibliomigrancy. This is through the Oriental Translation Fund that I find between 1800 and 1828. And um, this is, oops. And this is important to remember because it's not as if Goethe makes his statement as this genius that he's always thought to be. Um, there is a material histor political history and Goethe sort of comes on the stage and makes that statement. There are things that are happening that lead to a particular idea. Then, of course, the other big find for me was Alois Sprenger, who is connected actually with Delhi College when the madrasa was, was converted into a Western institution in the mid 19th century. And uh, the, um, uh, Alois Sprenger, actually, he came to India. It's a complicated story I can tell you later, but um, he came to India, he was Austrian, but he came to India as a British citizen, as a doctor, as a doctor of medicine, but his heart was really in um, translating. And in, uh, he knew Arabic, Persian. He had studied with Hammer Potsdal, who was, uh, whose Persian translations then, then Goethe read. And Sprenger comes to India, gets involved in, um, you know, moves from Calcutta to Delhi, becomes the principal of Delhi College. And uh, then with one of his protégés, he goes to Ayodhya, um, not Ayodhya, I'm sorry, he goes to Lucknow, and he makes an entire catalogue 
of the libraries of Awadh. And then he takes 10,000 volumes with him to Germany, sells them. They are in the Sprenger collection. This is the catalog that he creates, compiled under the orders of the government of India. Right? A number of these books today sit in various German libraries, mostly in the Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin, but in German libraries. And this is the actual file of negotiations between the Royal Library in Berlin. There was a big con uh, competition between a Royal Library in Berlin and Royal Library in Munich, which I trace in this book as well. So on the one hand, Macaulay, who becomes part of the first chapter, Macaulay is saying um, there is absolutely no literatures of, uh, you know, and Macaulay also says, I've talked to, um, you know, I'm paraphrasing, people who have translated these works. And one shelf of a good English library, you know, would replace all of the literat literatures of Asia and Arabia. This is Macaulay. Um, Macaulay speaking at the same time as Goethe. And then there is this massive amounts of books then being transported um, to Germany, but not just to Germany. You know, they're being transported to Paris. They're being transported to London. Um, so world literature has its roots in the 19th century, but then it gets revitalized in the 20th and now the 20th century. And here too, the world economy, world market, um, nation state formation around the two world wars takes precedence. So now you see that during the first world war, there is this magazine that is launched in Germany called Die Weltliteratur. And, and if you read through the magazines, and I know Francesca is working on magazines in a different way. If I, I was fascinated by this magazine because the magazine also has ad, had ads that please subscribe to this magazine and send it to our brave soldiers who are fighting on the battlefield, right? They were translating, they were creating this readership of world literature for soldiers who were fighting on behalf of Germany, um, translating in German. And then comes Hesse in 1929. Hesse makes this, uh, uh, writes this beautiful essay. He was a best-selling author by then. Um, um, Siddhartha, Damian, they were all on best-selling lists. So he writes this essay, Eine Bibliothek der Weltliteratur, written for the common readers. And here, this is my translation from 2017, um, where he sort of makes a connection between Goethe's idea and then his own idea of world literature, defines world literature, but helps a reader of world literature formulate their own library of world literature. Um, it's a fascinating article. I make a big deal out of it in my chapter on the Second World War um, because, uh, or the interwar period, and I tell you why, because that's also the time when Tagore was in um, Europe on invitation of Mussolini, actually. And on his way back, he stopped by in Switzerland and met with the Nobel laureate, uh, Romain Roland. And they both were actually thinking about a library of world literature, a house of friendship um, that would bring together, and you know, um, um, uh, Vishwa Bharati had already been um, established, Shanti Niketan. And so that cosmopolitan idea comes back after the First World War, but it's a wrong time to think about it because then soon the Nazis will take over. And here's the, the Nazi takeover, not only of Germany, but also of the term world literature. Nazis have their own magazine called Die Weltliteratur. And of course, you can imagine that the authors are all based on racial purity, um, you know, Aryan, but um, they're producing lists after lists. This is really, this is a chapter within, uh, this is a book within, mini book within my book. Um, it's called uh, On the, Sh the uh, Shadow of Empty Shelves. And um, this is the, the burning of books, the banning of books, the manipulation of world literature that happens here. Post-war period comes Auerbach, reflects, does, can we still relate to the world Weltliteratur. And the translation is by Myron Edward Said, as Goethe did both to the past and to the future. Um, Auerbach is very much also invested in the 
um, graduate education or the education of a new generation of scholars. He's writing this essay in the United States. He's at Yale at the time he writes it. Um, but the tension that he sees, it's almost in my reading of Auerbach, I also make, uh, a, I, I was struck by sort of how utterly incapable he is of grasping the new political reality of the world. world. Because our, for Auerbach, um, Chinese literature or Indian literature is not really at par with literatures from Europe. So it's a very, very Eurocentric statement as well. Um, this becomes important because Auerbach is doing this in the United States, whereas now starts an ideological division. This is the Reclam um, publishers, and this is very socialist brochure, as you can see. Eine neue Zeit erfordert eine neue Schule. A new time uh, looks for a new school. And what kind? East Germany is the one nation that I found which actually had a program of world literature, of reading world literature, starting with um, high school, gymnasium. So they were actually, they were very invested. This is in Leipzig, this is divided Germany. They were very interested in a humanistic education, a socialist upbringing. So what do they start translating? Tagore's letters in Russia, um, um, this is uh, a collection of Indian essays with an introduction by Khwaja Ahmed Abbas. Um, then, of course, Brain Chen's Nirmala. Um, this is interesting. These are stories from Mauritius that they actually, Mauritian Hindi literature, they get translated. Bishan Sahani's Basanti. So there's an entire program of translating world literature, but not just from India. Um, I trace, you know, what books from Latin America, what books from Africa, they were also translating. And then I come to the European Library, um, the digital surrogate that I've talked about already. So few things in conclusion. One, the story of world literature is not a single story. It's a multi, it contains multiple stories of access, patronage, affordability, literacy. All of them become part of bibliomigrancy. Then world literature is not a randomly or accidentally circulated distributed body of text. To qualify, quote unquote, for categories such as timeless or masterpieces, these heavily laden words, right? Timeless classic, masterpiece, which reeks of the master-slave dynamic, that word itself. Um, there is an entire process that leads to the formation, the acceptance, recognition of a word as a timeless word. Then production, translation, and circulation have concrete and complex material and political histories. medial nature of library has to think about fact and fiction, history and memory, collection and dispersion, order and chaos. And that needs to, set, to be taken into account when we think about world literature. The, po the political charge of a post-colonial world literature can be understood if starting with the 19th century, and this is sort of the central thesis of my book, we, how world literature is historically conditioned, culturally determined, and politically charged. So what I'm going to do in the next few slides is end with certain post-colonial statements that do not come from Germany. One, of course, and they're in a chronological order, this is Mahadevi Verma, um, and this is from Sahitya Sanskriti or Sambhashan, is a, a, a speech she gave to the uh, joint session of the uh, UP Vidhan Sabha in 1968. And she says, Sahitya ki bhoomi par Kalidas aur Tulsi Das jitne hamare hain, utne hi pure vishw ke hain. Aur Shakespeare aur Tolstoy jitne saare vishw ke hain, utne hi hamare bhi hain. Hum dharti ko baantne ke liye unchi diwaare mana sakte hain, par un diwaaron se akash chote chote tukhoon mein nahi baat chata. Hum badano ko tol kar nahi baat sakte. हम प्रकाश की किरणों को नाप कर वितरित नहीं कर सकते वो प्रत्येक के होने के लिए ही हर एक के दिस इज अ की टर्म वो प्रत्येक के होने के लिए ही हर एक के 
once again, the idea, Goethean or Marx and Engels' idea of this universal possession, this Gemeingut, is phrased very differently by Mahadevi Verma, right? They belong to everyone in that they belong to each one. Then, of course, comes uh, Oram Pamuk. Um, this is from, I'm not going to read the Turkish part, this is from his work, uh, Anklar, uh, Other Colors. Um, and he talks about literature as much, literature is as much a delicately constructed memory as it is a subtly constructed forgetting. Where literature, he says, has a global fraternity of readers, influences, borrowings, and infatuations that counter the frightening power of nationalism. Taking from Goethe, that pedantic arrogance that Goethe speaks about, but making sense of it in a very different way, at a distance from Auerbach. And of course, we have the American author, essayist Susan Zontag, um, and this is a speech she gave uh, right after 2007. Um, to have access to literature, world literature, was to escape the prison of national vanity, of philistinism, of compulsory provincialism of inane schooling, imperfect destinies, and bad luck. Literature was the pa passport to enter a larger life, a zone of freedom. Let's see how its zone of freedom is playing out today. One, of course, this is Siegel Books, Calcutta. This is not a one-way street, world literature. So instead of Reklam uh, publishing translations of Indian works into German, Today we have this correspondence between Max Frisch and Friedrich Dürrenmatt, two great Swiss authors, translated by um, a German translator, but published in India, in Kolkata. Then of course, Jaipur Litfest, everyone knows it. And this I love. This is from just this morning, Zuban Books, another great publisher that I have great uh, respect for. For the first time, your favorite feminist ebooks can travel directly from us to you. This is feminist bibliomigrancy at its best. And last, it's not just the grand libraries that bibliomigrancy of world literature attracts us to. These are the kind of libraries that draw, have drawn my attention and will continue to. This is in Kerala, and I love the qualification. Mr. Chinna Tambi is 73, he's a tea vendor, sports club organizer, and librarian. And look at this grand library. For me, it's one of the most beautiful libraries in the world. Last, Shaheed Bhagat Singh Library. This is from the Sangu border. Um, this is an article in the Telegraph that I found a couple of weeks ago. And it's a movement that I've been writing about as well. Um, the reason why I want to end with this it's the last sentence of my own book, to understand our own pact with books, all we need to do is unpack someone else's library. I thank you all. Did I lose connection? Thank you, Venkat. Thanks a lot. This was a fascinating talk and it brought together so many themes. Uh, we'll directly go to the, the question and answer session. Uh, for all the uh, audience members, if you want to ask uh, uh, you know, any question or if you want to comment on something that Venkat mentioned, please send in your questions through the Q&A function or simply through the chat. I'll read them out and Venkat would respond. So in the meantime, Venkat, let me start with uh, one of the fascinating things you mentioned, you know, uh, in the first part of your library, uh, of, sorry, of your talk. You know, this idea, this is something I have been struggling with, and this has been a major uh, point of, of discussion in our understanding of world literature, not only world literature, but also about the development of Oriental scholarship and how it reached Germany. Because there is a case of German exceptionalism, isn't it? Even Said's book also mentions this, that though Germany never had an empire, the kind of empire that France and Britain or the Netherlands had, Germany somehow, and in fact, there was no Germany in late 18th, early 19th century, but Germany somehow developed this 
became this hub of oriental scholarship and later of indology more specifically so how do you track this i remember there is a very interesting sentence in sides uh, not orientalism but in uh, one of his later books where he says that calcutta produces london transmits paris distills and generalizes there is no berlin or no germany as yet this is late 18th early 19th century but by mid 19th century germany becomes this and this becomes one of the contexts within which goethe could articulate something like world literature he already read hafiz and and uh, kalidas through uh, jones's translation for instance he was reading these chinese novels when he discusses the idea of world literature with ekeman so how do you think about the german ex exceptionalism on the one hand and this context through which something like world literature could emerge if you could you know speculate Uh, I'd be happy to. This is a fantastic observation, um, Baidik. Thank you. The um, you know Said in his Orientalism already, and this is uh, 1978, in the very beginning of the book. He says German Orientalism was a scholarly Orientalism, and I take great issue with that with that phrasing, with that sentence that German Orientalism was only scholarly Orientalism, because. only scholarly means nothing right we have to unravel the implications of what that scholarly production of knowledge has what kind of political implications he has and um a great rejoinder to that actually comes from gaitri spivak uh, in a critique of post colonial reason and in that book at the beginning she talks about germany in the 19th century as a place of birth of difference in comparison so she talks about the world family of languages she writes about you know the birth of comparative literature comparative religion comparative linguistics and that for me becomes an in into both taking issues with said's statement but also taking spivak's statement to a different level so there was actually you know there was a, a known statement given the print cultural landscape of germany in the early 19th century there was a massive effort both among scholars and remember this is enlightenment at its highest right so the print culture is exploding in germany that's when um in the absence of of actual colonies the statement that is made is dochla uh, i mean It, the idea is not deutschland but it is an empire it's a bücherreich even though deutschland does not exist as a political entity as we know it won't until 1871 um there is a an effort that there will be an empire of books that creates leads to the establishment and see this is where the academy becomes very important that leads to the establishment of major chairs of sanskrit literature um of indian study indic studies um in leipzig and then the brockhaus the big encyclopedia families invested in it so i mean that so there's a print cultural development it's not at the same scale as in london or in paris so there i will give said you know his statement but it's not just a scholarly orientalism there is the german orientalist society that has been formulated etc right hope that that answers a little bit okay uh, one of my colleagues ravikant wants to uh, ask you a question i'm just putting him on video ravikant go ahead mm -hmm. yeah thanks uh, uh, radit and uh, thanks uh, professor venkat mani i i read your introduction also just before the talk started that uh, I really uh, love the way you uh, set it up. Uh, we have uh, a shared kind of childhood uh, in 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 you know Soviet books and Soviet uh, uh, vans traveling to our locations and uh, getting the opportunity to Nandan also. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, Francesca also talks about you no know, literature to Sarika and Sarita and other magazines. of the that time and story magazines but uh, and and at the news in a way right and the aha zindagi for example which is a popular middle class magazine mm -hmm. uh, pub published from jaipur still publishes world literature uh, mm -hmm. and uh, both classics as well as some new stuff and then the the old of 
little uh, magazines uh, that are mostly left liberal but they continue uh, to uh, you know these are kutir udyogs of uh, hindi literary world uh, so from small towns all over all. but i wanted to you know uh, uh, ask you uh, because i work on intermediality and uh, uh, just as you know uh, premchand and others also people in urdu literature they learned the st- uh, craft of story writing as alok rai has it by translating the you know masters uh, from the uh, world masters so so that that, that uh, backdrop uh, drop is very important as you also underlined that translation is 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 a, is a phenomenal uh, kind of a creative exercise which also shapes the actual original works in several uh, areas uh because we didn't have a very you know thriving tradition of story writing short story writing at least so uh so uh as far as uh, you know uh, also uh, it continue uh, literature continue to be important for radio as you pointed out and for cinema uh most of the south asian cinema at least hindi cinema is you know literature uh, inspired by uh, stories from literature and we are yet to you know account for that uh, uh kind of a uh, uh, debt to literature i think uh, uh it has been dismissed uh, so far not not really engaged with so uh, uh, also uh, it was literature which supplied the inis because most of the uh, people who worked with radio did not uh, had had no uh, mastery over the technique of uh, broadcasting and there was hardly any school so it is the uh, either the tawaifs who were performing right uh, in the real world or the dastan goes others or it could have it to be the the, the uh, uh, mostly of urdu and hindustani as well as hindi when india becomes independent because urdu is changed out of india radio establishment and hindi replaces it at least in delhi and in hindi uh, areas so, So oh, there is a kind of nationalistic uh, turn uh, that uh, uh, that uh, takes place uh, uh, at the uh, in the post independence period as well uh, the way departments are defined the way uh, the departments at air would be defined and stuff like that but with the coming of the internet uh, these there is a possibility now uh, where the the old uh, boundaries or the old walls between languages get broken uh in a in a new way so you if you look at the first generation of websites uh, hindi urdu are together you don't see if you look at rekhta now which is a thriving website you have hindi and urdu together and also now you also, uh, we are also transitioning uh the world of books in a way books as printed objects because we are going back to a more natural uh you know state of language itself where the audio is more important oral is more important than the written and the printed and so the languages that lost out for example uh you know lost out on the print bus they can also make a comeback so future of the new is of a new internationalism will have to be include other languages uh, that uh, were not modern languages uh, 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 which uh, uh, I'll, i'll stop now so sorry i i i been uh, made a long winding comment but you can choose to react on whatever part you wish so it's a rich set of thank ideas you. Uh, thank you so much uh, this is a very rich set of ideas and uh, what i'm going to do is venkat just one second uh, we have few more questions would you like to take them in a bunch and respond or would you like to uh, respond individually i can do that let's give you know what this is audience time so let's give everyone a time to speak and i'm i'm making notes as you see so okay. i can i can then bundle it up absolutely great so we have one question uh from uh one of our uh, audience members babu thaliat uh i can't make you visible Anna- Prathama had also had a question. Yes, Prathama, I see a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Yes, three of them already have questions. Babu Thaliat, please. Uh... Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi. Hello, hello, Bengal. Hi. Hello, hello, Babu. How are hi, you? Hi, hi. Fine, thank you. Thank you. So nice to hear you, Bengal, and especially in this pandemic time. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, like it's uh, based on the first question. Um, uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, the German literature has a unique character history, and 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 I'm I mean the literature from Lessing to uh, like say Kafka. Uh, it's the parallelity between the German uh, intellectual history, the Geistesgeschichte, and the literature epochs, literature epochen. So from Aufklärung to Stummendrang and then classic romantic uh, realism, na uh, naturalism, symbolism and all. So I think this could be one of the reasons why the literature, um, uh, in, I mean, even though Germany uh, had no colonies and it was not an imperium like uh, Britain or France, so, but because of this nexus with the Geistes Geschichte or the contextuality, I mean, the literature being together with philosophy and other uh, areas of humanities forming a Geistes Geschichte, the intellectual history, that, that literature automatically uh, uh, became world literature. I mean, the sense that, uh, uh, you know, crossing the boundaries and barriers uh, along with philosophy. And this is just a speculation. I would like to know your, I mean, hear your comments on that. Thank you. Thank you, Babu. I'm just collecting. Um, I have some, I know Prathama had a question, but yes, I'll just, uh, I'll... Balu and Gaurav have typed out something. So uh, Bedek, I'll let you, I'm just telling you, I'm keeping an eye on that. Okay. Uh, Prathama, would you like to go? Sure, sure. Right. Um, hi, um, Venkat, that was superb. It, I, I was just spellbound throughout the thing. So just Thinking with you, a couple of comments. One, and I've typed out some of those in the chat box. The first, I really wanted to um, know your thoughts on uh, the idea of the keyword as an optic uh, to navigate world literature as opposed to the framework of translation. Uh, because that creates a very different map of meanings and conceptual transaction. Uh, so any thoughts on that? That was the first thing that I had in mind. The second was, of course, just a loud thinking about how the story of traveling art objects uh, via exhibitions and museums have been so different from the story of bibliomigrancy, as you put it. And I'm also thinking, uh, because of my own personal taste, of world music and how that has played out in the 20th century and had no life, as far as I know, in the 19th. So that does interest me, if, if just in case you have thoughts on that. The other, the, the last thought I had, and this is again, only if you wish to respond to that. So there is a symmetry, I feel, between two transition narratives that we have here. One transition narrative is in some senses about technology transition from print to digital. And the other narrative that has to do with a thing in nature of objects and artifacts, which is the material, materialistic story uh, from books to the computer hardware, to the Kindle, to the tablets and such like. So I was wondering how do these two stories, technology and the object stories sit together? Just thinking with you, but this was like absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prathama. So uh, Venkat, should we take a couple of more or? Yeah, let's do that, you know, because uh, okay. there are some um, intersections too that have started emerging um, yeah. for me. And so Balu and Gaurav have questions as well. And I don't see if people have more on the chat box. I think two other participants also raised their hands. So we'll just take these two and then come back and take the next bunch, probably. Is that okay with you? Okay. So... Uh, Absolutely. Okay. That's completely fine with me. I'll try to, I do want to give as many people a chance to talk because I, God only knows I took my time. It's late in Delhi. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, 
One thing, um, this is react to Ravi Pant's essay on intermediality, the craft of story and the transition, uh, the, the significance of translation. Um, one thing um, for me, this question, and you know, you had a rich set of ideas, but I'm picking up on this, what I found to be the core of it. Let me connect this with uh, Prof. Ma's excellent observation um, on the asymmetry that she mentioned between transition, the technological transition and transformation, but also change in the nature of objects and the, uh, from what I thought, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, the, the actual literary implications. Pratama, I'll come to world music um, in a little bit. Let me just say by, um, start by saying that uh, in what is, what I haven't mentioned here, um, and that is part of the book, you know, let's give me the big picture, um, but herein come the nuances, that how aesthetic form then becomes into dialogue, right? So starting with Ravi Gant, and the idea of um, the craft of story writing and the great Hindi, Hindi authors also working as translators, um, not only of the works of, um, um, of Western authors, you know, if you think about um, Agye translating Gora from Bangla, or if you think about Shamshe uh, Bahadur uh, Singh, actually of all people, translating Alice in Wonderland into Hindi as Alice. Um, so there's a, there's a much longer tradition. What happens there is the adjustment of form, how literary form then becomes inflected or acted out differently. For me, that is where Goethe's incorporation of the third prologue in Faust, right, which is, which takes straight from Shakuntala. It actually, uh, this comes after, you know, the translation of Shakuntala into English and then into, into German. Um, that particular prologue is very much about, it's a dialogue between the actor, the, uh, you know, um, the actor, the director, and the playwright, and that is being communicated to the um, um, to the public. So um, th this formal traffic also happens in two different ways. So it's not just that the short story, the form of the short story acquires a different meaning. Short story, of course, has a much longer tradition without being called short story, right? The Galpakatha and, and um, whatever have you. There's a much longer tradition. But the story in the modern Western European sense, how that gets inflected, that's not just like a one-way traffic. That's happening with that. And Amir, um, these are friends. I mean, Mufti calls it the Sanskrit mania, right? That happens, uh, and Vedic has written about it. So uh, going back to, to the asymmetry now, um, what you uh, pointed out, Prathama, I don't think, I mean, the effort is not to think about asymmetries as something that debilitate our understanding of what happens between technology and aesthetic form. For me, what becomes important is with this explosion of print culture technology, where you also have Hindi and Sanskrit works being published. Um, I mean, there are machines that are occupied, uh, uh, occupied. there are machines that are required, um, you know, uh, uh, typesets founded, you know, both in Paris, in, in London, and in, um, in Berlin, and then in Munich. Um, the technological uh, advancement goes almost simultaneously with, not as fast as the internet, not as fast as the audio book, but the technological advancement happens um, in a kind of mutually enriching synergy with the forms that are being acquired. So there is, there might not be a great collaboration there that one sees in the early 19th century. Um, but the, the biggest event that has happened in the early 19th century is that the world is available in print, right? 
the, the explosion of print magazines, paper has become cheaper. And uh, with the rise in literacy, there is that acquisition. It's almost as uh, exciting a moment as early 20th, uh, 21st century and the internet. So there are correspondencies that you know, one can find. Um, world music, very quickly, uh, Katie Trumpner has written about it. Um, so I'll send you that essay. It's, it's a beautiful essay about world music. And another colleague has written about that. Um, we'll be in touch. And uh, Babu, um, for me, there isn't an automatic that German literature becomes world literature. Um, because that is what I'm trying to say, that the centers of power in Europe carry a kind of meaning. And if you go to the Oriental Translation Fund, the reduction of philosophical discourses coming out of uh, Persia or India as merely literary texts or not valid enough history, that creates a different kind of hierarchy, a different kind of asymmetry. So to think that, if you even think about the lang uh, landscape of world literature, you know, and this, this uh, periodic march that you mentioned from Aufklärung, Sturm und Drang, um, that kind of periodization happens. But in all literatures, you know, it's, it's a kind of normative periodization that one wants to look at. But to think that that automatically takes over the world and the world of readers, that does not happen immediately. That's in, and especially without the presence of, of translators. So the amount through which the uniqueness, so to say, every literature is unique, but the uniqueness of the German enterprise at that time is they are translating from German, uh, from um, world languages into German and slowly beginning to translate from German into other languages. So Goethe will, for example, enjoy his, his um, writings through, um, you know, the Scottish, uh, can't remember his name right now, you know, his, his written novels as well. Anyway, his French and English translations is a translation of Shakespeare that's happening in German too. So I don't take so the superiority of a literature because it was so important because of Aufklärung, etc., as a way of its circulation um, around the world. There is a mechanism, there is a vetting process, and that vetting process can also become um, horrendously colonial at times um, and horrendously racist at other times. So. I think I, I see what you're saying, but it's not the, there isn't an, a given that, you know, from Lessing to Kafka. Kafka becomes an entirely different story, of course. Kafka, according to UNESCO, is the most translated German author, um, you know, uh, in the world. But Kafka gets translated in different times for very different reasons. Kafka is not considered to be the greatest German author in for a long part of the 20th century, you know, especially in Germany, if you look at that history, the Bohemian author, it's, it's, so there are differences. There are differences within Germany too. Okay, shall we take more questions? Sorry, uh, my uh, colleague Ravi Sundaram wants to ask a question, so I'll allow his video. And then we have three questions and one comment in the Q&A. Once Ravi finishes, I'll read those out. Then you can respond to them as a bunch, probably. Thank you, Venkat. I mean, I was transfixed listening to you, frankly. <laughs> I had a drink and I made myself a cup of tea and then I was you know, following you everywhere. Now, here's the question. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting, you know, you, you laid out a whole range of things. Now, I was very curious uh, about one important component of the medial system which is that of copyright. So some of us who work in media studies, uh, you know, infrastructure in a way frames the world. It frames the way we access the world. It frames, you know, Hitler was very clear. It's the, it's, the, it's the eye through which meaning appears, right? Now, I was very curious how the system operates in your 
overall architecture because what you have is with with print in the in the 19th century the community of readers is not so large as we have now today copyright and the paywall system is really a core component of the media system right so how would you rework this you know through a more contemporary lens happy to may i quickly answer that because that's actually that's uh, at the core of uh, the study and continues to be um let me start with the infrastructural development the very physical infrastructure right um ravika thank you thank you both for your comments but also for this this important point um the the ex physical expansion of royal libraries let's start with that part infrastructure right the physical expansion of royal libraries in the early 19th century especially with materials from former colonies oh, oh not from former colonies from colonies british and and uh and uh, french um uh, spanish um colonies from around the world um that becomes an important part of developing infrastructural developing of collections that can um that the scholars can have access to right i'm starting with something very simple what that leads to is actually the physical expansion of libraries itself actual physical expansion so the uh, library in berlin staatsbibliothek zu berlin it's gone a major renovation just now right the old library which used to be in east germany has now in joint berlin you know it's been refurbished recreated so people can actually have access to these materials that's one thing that is happening second thing that happening copyright you mentioned copyright is important you know i mentioned reklam this important uh, publisher um reklam started out and i've traced this history to in 1867 they in november 1867 they will launch a cheaper edition paperback book series called reklam universal bibliothek universal library why november 1 1867 november 7 it is november 1 1867 all the copyright of all big authors in germany who died before 1836 right they have come out of copyright so of course they'll take goethe and launch the series with goethe's fast so before even you talk about paywall and copyright it's not as if copyright and paywall was not important in the 19th century in fact cesar dominguez has written an entire article about colonial copyright in 1820 years so that those concerns continue but if you think about the the uh, now you were moving more towards the world of the internet um the world of the internet is you know the the idea that everything can be accessed that also tends to be a fallacy because that's where two librarians collection developers um i couldn't get to the idea of keyword that uh, that prothema had mentioned but search keywords right those also become important to the development of a searchable infrastructure through which one can have access to knowledge so this is in brief saying that the concerns that you mention are absolutely right those concerns can be seen in development of library catalogs too a very so there's a there's a physical infrastructural development and there is a conceptual infrastructural development you can you know the example that i gave from east germany where there is a uh, an expansion of uh, um um a literary program to develop you know subsidized translations of works from india for works from all of the communist friend countries or works from latin america that's part of this infrastructure development somebody subsidizing right so there has to be that kind of an investment and um coming to the internet world uh, we all know it's not a free for all um so you know but those works how they appear on the international scene how they are digitized there is a whole process to it and same you know now google looks as completely failed the reason why they failed they couldn't put up the idea they couldn't 
difference between whether they are a public, uh, pub, they're there for public good, is it really a republic of letters, or whether they are a profit-making agency, right? So they went with Google Play instead. Anyway, um, Nandan, by the way, is available on Google Play, I found out. I was horrified. Uh, but good for children. They should read Nandan, whether on Google Play or whatever. Um, more questions. Venkat, Venkat, we'll have to take one more uh, video question from one of my uh, colleagues, Avadendra. And then we have to go to mm -hmm. our Q&A uh, box. Uh, there are several questions, yeah, yeah. one comment as well. Uh, Deepu, go ahead. Yeah, uh, th thanks, Venkat. Uh, that was uh, absolutely magnificent. Uh, no, this is not my field, so, so I'm coming at it from a slightly different angle. Uh, which is, I get the sense that reaching out to other cultures, or let's say books of other cultures, is a big part of this world literature thing. So if you're a German, you want to read uh, books from Asia. If you're from Asia, you want to read Shakespeare or whatever. What I think that enough uh, is whether in this conception of world literature, the act of becoming in common commands any place right, in thinking about world literature. So when you talked about Zuban books coming home to you, that's really in, in an older 20 year back language would be a subaltern attempt at becoming in common as part of a world literature. And my sense was that doesn't seem to come enough. How do people make themselves into world literature? Not how powerful entities, select what constitutes world literature. So Venkat, uh, would you, you like me to answer that now or collect it? It's entirely up to you, whichever way okay. you want. Okay. Um, Abhidinder, this is uh, the act of becoming common, the subaltern elements that you mentioned, people becoming world literature. The grander picture that I gave was, for me, it is very important uh, in order to pursue um, a subaltern methodology of approaching history or literary history. And you heard my comment to Babu's uh, question yeah. as well. It is very important to unravel bigger institutional setups, right? Just like the subaltern school did with the institution of the archive. That's Deepesh Chakrabarti's central question. How do you write the history of people where there are no documents? Right? And so how do you write a history that has not been written or that has only been written in a particular way? For that, one has to go and blast, blast not physically, I'm not for violence, um, one has to say that, but metaphorically, one has to undo these major Eurocentric institutions, such as the library, such as the museum. Okay, now let's come to the second part of it, which is the act of becoming common. Once you have done that institutional critique, new avenues open up. In my case, it was very important for me to then go back to uh, something that I'd been meaning to write for a very long time, and uh, that was about uh, Hindi literature in Mauritius. Now, Hindi literature that comes out of Mauritius, and especially in this long essay that I wrote on Abhimanyu Anat, um, the great novelist, you know, he's like the Premchand of Mauritius, but, and he used to be very famous in India in the 70s and 80s, Dhanmyug, uh, Sarika, all of these magazines used to publish him, serial novels. Um, but um, he, he says, Ki mujhe apne hi desh mein, uh, pathak nahi milte. right? His books were being published in India because India was the center of publishing books in Devanagari. So there, and especially through his novels, but also through the history of Girmitya, you then find out how much of bibliomigrancy, how much of that becoming common was happening through a class of people who were either completely, I'm going to use it in quotes, illiterate formally, but extremely literate, educated in major religious traditions, right? Um, stories of Alaudal, Ramayan, all of these got transmitted. This is a bibliomigrancy of a very different kind um, that happens, that becomes part of the indentured laborers' songs 
You know, they call Mauritius Marich because it is that shape-shifting, um, um, illusory place, not just the person. So is a, that becoming, how do people make themselves? When we ask this question, if we move beyond uh, the middle class reader who tends to have access to particular kinds of materials, consumption, you know, using the word from, from Marx and Engels, that kind of strategy of affiliation, it's not just about, okay, next on my list is a book from Africa, next on my list is a book from etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is about connecting with literature, and it's not just spatial, it can be temporal. It's also about connecting with literature in a different way with, uh, with that might come out of your own tradition. Now, I'll end this with, with a simple uh, example. I just reread Derek Walcott's um, Nobel Prize acceptance speech. It's about Ram Lila in the Caribbean, right? Um, I was doing some research on Rehana, which let me do that, which let me do Derek Walcott. I mean, this is, um, this is Caribbean tradition at its best. So there are different kinds of making themselves, making oneself common, um, selecting, building that program. I mean, and, and, you know, several comments have been made about uh, Hindi magazines and Soviet book land, but there are many other possibilities, you know? So hope that clears up or yeah, gets to you. the core of, you know, what you were saying. It's an important point, but it can't just be answered through the framework of a middle-class reader is what I'm trying to say. Because a lot of traditions, you know, even in, in songs that you think uh, um, from the uh, uh, Hatan Vibis, you know, the, the song will start somewhere else and it'll be a folk song. And then um, somewhere you'll have a line from the Ramayan or somewhere you'll have a Noha from, um, you know, from uh, the... Um, uh, uh, the, I don't want to use the wrong word. Uh, Nohe? Um, Anis. Yes, thank you. Um, and then I just finished reading, you know, think about becoming, becoming one's, uh, becoming common. Um, I just finished reading um, um, you know, after um, I heard of his passing away. And there you see the bringing together of so many different kinds of traditions. It's not just, um, it's not just the middle class reader. Um, that, that suturing happens in multiple ways. Yeah? Okay. Rekat, we'll now go to the Q&A box. Let's uh, do that. We have some questions and some comments as well. The first one is from Balu Nair. Mm -hmm. um, Balu Nair wants to ask you if this transition from you know, physical books to digitization will have, uh, he actually uses, will it decimate the concept of world literature? Will it be a challenge? I think that is something. Gaurav Sonic has two questions. Uh, Gaurav wants to ask you about the influence of the translation of Bhagavad Gita on German culture in early 19th century and whether that translation was instrumental in uh, the quest for a German self, let's say, against particularly against French domination and whether it led to a rejuvenation of their national political culture. And then later, uh, Gaurav also mentions another point that how do you think or how do you account for the role of German romanticism in this history? Uh, then somebody, uh, Shashwat Panda, uh, Shashwat's question is, could you please share your thought on piracy and copyright in the context of Biblio Migrants? I think you partly answered that when you were responding to uh, Sundaram, Ravi Sundaram's uh, uh, question. Then we have one comment from Anu Aneja. Um, anu is suggesting that uh, since you made that uh, point about world literature being a politically charged category, she thinks that great books as another category probably mm -hmm. was able to hide the sinister designs more efficiently, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, and then we have a couple of questions from Keshav Bansal. Uh, what role does access play in classification and subsequent transition of a book slash media to the category of world literature? How has this access changed or has it remained the same? And also some uh, disregard world literature as a colonial archive and stress upon national literature as mode of decolonization. What are your views? So these are more or less what we have in the Q&A box. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you all, Balu, Gaurav, Shashwat, um, Anu and Kesha for, for these fantastic points and questions. Um, I'll try to touch upon uh, sort of the core of, because packed within your questions are also a couple of questions. So I'll, I'll try to select what I perceive here as, as um, uh, the most striking point. And Balu, um, with the one thing that I've, I've been trying to um, to communicate is um, the digitization of books and libraries actually does not create universal access. So this is where, you know, the uh, library subscriptions, if you just think about journals, um, I'll, uh, a few years ago, um, Robert Danton, who I mentioned earlier, you know, he's the, the uh, um, uh, director of Harvard Libraries, and he had written a, a, a massive article about uh, how certain journals, and especially in the field of medicine, now I'm not talking literature, certain journals in the field of medicine, their subscription is so expensive that even Harvard is thinking about it. You know, rethinking like how much money to invest in these kinds of journals. So um, the reason why I bring this up is, you know, Harvard, as you know, um, and I, you know, luckily also work for a very well endowed public library. Um, but the subscription of journals and especially digital subscription of journals, that that's not entirely, um, does not entirely make them cost effective. So for anything to reach the public, somebody has to pay. In our case, the taxpayer is paying. In, the, in Harvard's case, you know, the endowments and whatever they have it, that's paid. Um, we also raise money through grants, you know, for the libraries. This is what librarians do. So universal access itself is, uh, is not entirely... Uh, um, uh, universal access means universal access for some, not for others. So there is a discrepancy there. Right, and uh, whether or not it will lead to the dissemination or decimation of the concept of world literature as we know it. So on the one hand, um, this passing over from nation state to um, the idea of a borderless global uh, world literature, that hasn't quite happened because even now the identification of literary objects is very much according to the national traditions uh, where they come in. And this is where, you know, years of our nationalist methodology um, that started in Europe in the 19th century, Vedic is smiling because he's also trying to undo it in different ways. You know, our nationalist methodology of categorizing literature or, you know, a 150 year old tradition cannot be undone overnight. And so that is why on the one hand, we can have this kind of dialogue between think about how the meanings of national literature change today. Think about, let's say, how Dalit literature in India was never considered part of national literature. And now you have canonic Dalit authors that you look forward to reading, right? Um, I was mentioning, um, you know, Malayalam literature uh, has played a very important role in worlding literature because Malayalam has a very long tradition of translating, uh, works directly from French, works directly from Portuguese. Now think about the colonial history there as well, right? Um, into Malayalam. Does that mean that today when one thinks about Indian national literature, immediately Malayalam literary authors pop up? Unfortunately not, and that needs to be undone. So what I'm trying to say is there is a much, much work needs to be done within the category of, of uh, national literature, especially 
in multilingual, rich multilingual traditions um, like India in order for us then to be able to say, okay, these are the works of world literature. Last example that I will give, uh, this is not about universal access, um, but it's about, uh, I edited an anthology, um, the companion to world literature, Wiley Blackwell, right? Um, this is a traditional example, but I was struck by the fact that none of the 19th century or even the 20th century anthologies of world literature that had most important religious did not have um, the good run side. I just could not believe that not one single anthology actually had a commentary on Sri Guru Granth Sahib, which for me is one of the most literary, world literary texts that actually acknowledges poetry in Punjabi, poetry in Fati, a mixture of Farsi and Punjabi, um, and of course the words of the Gurus themselves. Now, creating that kind of a shift, even within national literary realms, or trying to understand, trying to change the world reader's perspective to specific national literatures by including works that may not have been included, even the most canonical works. I think that's where the enterprise lies for me. So decimation, maybe not yet, just because the groundwork of rethinking has not happened. And it's certainly not happening through the digitization. We know digitization is giving much more access, but not quite. Gaurav, da bin ich überfragt. Yeah, I won't be able to exactly comment on um, the impact of Bhagavad Gita, um, although I know, and this is something that I'm learning from your work, you know, why Bhagavad Gita translations become important. Um, they are being read the one thing that I've learned, and this is another essay where Bedek and I both are publishing, and this is Debajani's uh, history um, of world literature. That's um, what I found was uh, there is a world, there, are, there is a readership that is created around the world, especially after Mahatma Gandhi in 1907, 1908 starts talk about the talking about the Gita as a central as, as something very important to him. And then Thoreau reads it um, before that, you know, um, no, and then Annie Basant and the Theosophical Society translates it. There's a long tradition of translating and in Germany, it is translated, you know, way before the 19th century, but what exactly that it has on German identity, um, in contrast with French culture, uh, that's not something that I have thought about, but we talk about it more. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll love to learn from you how to process that. Um, the notion of piracy and copyright, yes, that I have touched upon, Shashwat, so I hope to an extent that was answered. Um, Anu, um, very important point, great books. Yes, the great books tradition, right? So thinking one and about timeless, about masterpieces, um, that great books tradition that is that becomes the pedagogical part of world literature, right? Then you select a particular set of works um, that qualify as world literature or qualify as great books. Great books tradition, and this is uh, that's why Zuban is so important to me. Great books um, for the longest time did not include writings by women or very very few writings by women, and certainly no writings by uh, women of color. So there is that discrepancy, you know, when you say that the politically charged nature of world literature, the great books category, and especially with the canon wars in the United States in the 1980s, which continues now in a very different way after Black Lives Matter, uh, the significance of Toni Morrison in American national literature or the significance of thinking about slave narratives as part of bibliomigrancy, but also as part of great books, uh, thinking about the entire Asian American experience. I think that's central to our rethinking of great books. And I would say same with India. So you can't just think about, you know, 
Crainton, you have to think about all of the women novelists from India, you have to think about Dalit novelists, you have to think about, um, I'm just speaking about the novel here. Um, so those great Indian books, the concept of great Indian books can also enrich a lot. And I'm, you know, I was talking to Balu about this Malayalam literature. I, who is it? Ovi Vijayan, right? After the hanging and other stories or, um, the novel about that village that he creates. Oh my God. That's just, um, everybody should be reading that. I can't remember its name. What was that? Can do that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. It's such an amazing novel. It's very much like actually think about great books. Um, 100 years of solitude placed in the local, invested in the local, but truly speaking to the world. Now that's only available to me, that for me, and it's not about what is great book for you, what is great book for me, but the idea is the politically charged nature will come not just from expansion of the canon, but a selective strategic inclusion of authors, of translated works that have hitherto been unthought of, and that's a collective enterprise. Um, hope I know that answers or that responds to your question a bit. Um, borrowing privileges? Absolutely. So borrowing privileges is a term that US libraries, when you get a card, you get, that card is called a borrowing privileges card. That means you can borrow materials from that particular library. Borrowing is not ownership. That is one of the reasons, reasons why I like that term, borrowing privileges. So it's not just about the privilege of owning something, it's a privilege of borrowing. And that borrowing for me becomes important when you think about the difference between sampati and sampada. Sampada is something that you can share, right? You have it as, um, I mean, at the end of the, my book, I say, um, if national literatures are literatures of inheritance, world literature is a literature of inhabitants, that we actually try to inhabit a world with which we have not uh, connected with before. And we do so through the act of translation. So the privilege here, but that has to come with the privilege of literacy, first of all, right? You have to be literate in order to be able to read. And that's why, you know, I was citing the example of Germitia earlier. So it's not just about uh, and even if then you are literate, you know, second thing you ask about what part does access play? Access can be thought of not just in terms of classification and uh, translation of books and media. Access has to be thought with people with all kinds of physical impairments, learning disabilities. We have to elevate the idea of disability itself, not just literacy, not just physical ability, so that ability itself has to be questioned when we think about access. And that access has drastically changed. It has not remained the same. Um, last thing, world literature as a colonial archive um, and national literature as a mode of decolonization. I would like to think otherwise. I think the way the term national literature developed, especially from the 19th century to the 20th, and became the score of you know, the best writers and the best readings of, the, of this particular and that particular national tradition, it had bearings of the colonial hangover of nationalist methodology. And that's where Germany becomes, Germany was perfect in nationalizing in the 19th century. And this is where you know, the, the idea of national literature, I mean, think about English literature, I don't work on English literature, but the, the establishment of, of English departments or creation of an English syllabus for the colonies, this is Gaudi Vishwanathan's work, right? That nationalization itself had hints of colonialism. So for me, world literature today becomes a way of thinking um, against this kind of ethno-national reification of literary artifacts. And that's where I say that, you know, for me, um, the works of uh, authors, Turkish German, Japanese German, Afro-German authors, those are the kind of authors I teach under the category German literature, very different kind of national literature, a very different kind of world literature. Um, God of Romantics, uh, for German romanticism, you know, there, there are many, many um, sort of ideas about uh, their, um, what is it? Um, 
there's a connection in the early 19th century, you know, with Shakuntala, with, with Theada. Uh, so there's different kind of poetic romanticism, but um, right with the Bhagavad Gita in the early 20th century, I'm not entirely sure. What I can think about actually is, you know, Siddhartha gets published in the early 20th century. And I'm also thinking of what is uh, Edwin Arnold, isn't it? Light of Asia. Light of Asia that gets translated and that gets re received in a different way. And of course, 1913, Gitanjali. Um, Tagore gets the Nobel Prize, different story. So it, it, it's not connected with romanticism, but it's a different kind of poetic tradition that is then introduced. I hope I've covered all of these questions. Yes, so, thank boy, you. you guys are brave. It's pretty late in India. <laughs> but thank you so much. I think we have uh, exhausted all the questions and comments in the Q&A uh, box. Thank you, Venkat. Thanks a lot. As all my colleagues said, we are just transfixed. This was fascinating. Thank and you. I hope that very soon we'll have in-person uh, sessions as well and we'll be able to host you in CSDS very soon once again. Thanks Thank a lot for much. taking your time out to have this conversation with us. Thank you. Thank you. This was truly an honor. I want to thank everybody who stayed up this late. It really means a lot to me and to see so many um, old friends come and so many newer conversations beginning. So thank you again, Bedek. This was completely, the honor and pleasure was entirely mine. Thank you for being such an engaging audience. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Have Bye. a great day. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.